Welcome back to The Shepherd's Pie, a slice of faith for our messy lives. I'm Tony Kolank, a professor at Ave Maria School of Law, also the father of five grown children and the author of Inspirational Fiction for Teens and Adults. By the way, if you are still looking for a great Christmas gift for that special teen in your life, definitely check out the books at catholicteenbooks.com. If you haven't seen what they have on there, there's about 16 of us authors with great choices for your teens that you don't ever have to worry about their content. Uh, And also my medieval fiction series is on there, The Harwood Mysteries, which uh, book five just released and uh, the final book will be out next year. But today we're speaking with Deacon Kevin Martin about the challenges of faith and terminal illness. My guest today is Deacon Kevin P. Martin Jr. He is a partner at a national CPA and consulting firm headquartered in New York, but he's also a Catholic permanent deacon ordained in the Archdiocese of Boston. He lives in Milton, Massachusetts with his wife and their four children, and he also spends a lot of time with his mom, Claire, talking about his father's legacy, and he actually wrote a book on that topic that we're going to be talking about today, and it's called All is Well. Life Lessons from a Preacher's Father. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Tony. I really appreciate the invitation. I appreciate the work that you're doing with the podcast and your writing for teens. And I can relate to having a bunch of kids. So I've got four grown children and two dogs and a crazy home as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about yourself. So obviously you're up in Boston and you're a deacon but also a a CPA. So some people might not quite fully understand how all that works. So maybe just give us a little more background on yourself. So grew up in Boston, grew up in South Boston, grew up in the city, inner city kid all around. My dad was a CPA, so certified public accountant involved in audits and tax work and business consulting and the classic trusted advisor. So my dad being a big influence in my life, I ended up following in kind of the family footsteps, if you will, went to the same university as my dad. My mom still lives in the house that I grew up in. It was just a great working class neighborhood to grow up in, very gentrified and in lots of walks of life. I was just thrilled growing up there. Love being in Boston, love being a CPA, love what I do. Can't believe I've been married for 32 years as of a couple of weeks ago. So life just continues to push forward not by years, but by decades sometimes. Yeah, it seems like that. So actually, yeah, that's pretty cool. You're you're married, but you're a deacon. How did you discern, you know, your calling and, uh, you know, what goes into becoming a deacon? So it's interesting. When I was growing up, our home is near the local church, and the church is cathedral size. And we would always kind of sit in those last five rows of the church, like many families do, and the altar seemed like it was a football field away and never really had a sense of what was happening up there. I had the privilege of going to Boston College High School, a great Jesuit school, and really kind of found myself there on many levels of just spirituality, religion. And I can remember my guidance counselor would celebrate Mass and he'd invite the guys up around the altar. And here I was kind of always kind of being a football field away from the altar. And now I'm like on top of it and really just kind of came into myself of, wow, this is what's happening up here. This is like a miracle going on up here. And during that time period, I had actually thought about becoming a priest and discerned that a little bit. And then I think that discernment, I ultimately knew I wanted to get married, have kids and, and didn't go down that path. And then, you know, like many people that sometimes, you know, we're growing up, and my kids are there today, they're not all going to church, and, and we kind of find ourselves and lose ourselves and find ourselves and got married, had kids, and at that time, I think, uh, was kind of in and out of church a little bit, but then along the way, we got heavily involved in church again. Kids made all their sacraments, felt like I was kind of getting the call again that I just couldn't get the radio to stop. And it wasn't until I 
picked up the phone, if you will, that I felt like I was being called again to something and started exploring the diaconate. And the diaconate, it's interesting. It's really a big part of my life. I'm celebrating a, a wedding on Friday night. I'm involved with the funeral on Saturday. And on Sunday, I've got four baptisms. And next weekend, I'm preaching a couple of masses. And the opportunity to be involved in hospice visits, a very emotional and difficult time for families. And I try to, mostly I try to do no harm and to listen and to offer compassion and care and concern. And those are all just beautiful qualities that hopefully, not just deacons, but that we all have. But I feel just very privileged to be working in the church. We're all called, just like you're called with this podcast and talking to different people. We're all called in so many ways to be spouses and fathers or caregivers or life takes us down different paths. So the the diaconate for me has been a um, beautiful blessing in my life. Working with hospice, that's probably also something that you must have had some experience with yourself because I know your book approaches a very uh, difficult topic for a lot of families uh, when they're dealing with a loved one who is uh, ill and especially terminal illness. Uh, Now, the title of your book, All is Well, Life's Lessons from a Preacher's Father. Can you tell us a little bit about how you picked your title for that? So my dad uh, was diagnosed with ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, for many people from a term perspective, and it come on quickly. And he passed away quickly. And uh, interestingly enough, ALS is one of those diseases that you often diagnose by default. So we chased it for a year. Uh, The doctors thought, very healthy guy, 78 years old, played sports growing up, ate well. He was on less medication than I am. Just a healthy guy and started getting some difficulty swinging a golf club. And the doctors would say, hey, Kev, you're 78. You probably got some arthritis. Started having some problems with his back and the doctors would say, hey, Kev, you probably got a herniated disc. We should do an MRI. Started having some difficulty breathing. The doctors would say, well, there's heart issues in the family. Maybe you need a stent and we should probably do a treadmill test. So we chased all of these things for quite a while until some more obvious symptoms, tripping a little bit, some what they call fasciculations, which is twitching in the muscle joints because neurologically the muscles start to take on a, a life of their own. So other more obvious symptoms started to kick in that referred him to neurology. And again, trying to work through all those different neurological diseases, he ultimately got diagnosed with ALS and then died about a month later. So it was, I'm an only child, very close to my dad, worked in the family business with him for 30 years, so engaged with him every day on some level, uh, just a very, very difficult time. So the title all is well. So the preacher's father, obviously on the preacher, the life lessons aren't coming from me, they're coming from my dad. All is well. When he had passed away, he ended up spending the last five days of his life in the Mass General Hospital. World-renowned, spend a lot of, they, they do a lot of good in the Healy Center for ALS research and care and Felt very comfortable with that top off the top worldwide hospital, but he ended up in there intubated, couldn't speak. Cover of the book has like a legal pad, a journal. The hospital gave him a journal to, to write in because he had a tube down his throat, so he couldn't speak. So a lot of those life lessons kind of came full circle in the hospital, uh, where he was kind of reiterating just lessons learned in many ways, but his very last writing in the book before he passed away after 25 pages of notes was all as well. And it was comforting in a way in hindsight, I guess, and that his last words weren't about pain. His last words weren't about, I'm, I'm afraid. His last words were all as well. And there's a great story in the second book of Kings from the Shumanite woman whose son had died. And that despite her sadness and frailty, when everybody asked how she was, she said, it is well, all is well. And it really has kind of stuck with me so much that the title of the book, uh, All is Well, is actually in my dad's handwriting. And that title of the book has actually become the family tattoo. I never thought in my entire life 
I was going to get a tattoo when I was 59 years old, have a tattoo on my right arm of all as well in his handwriting. My daughter's got one. I was so upset at her when she got a tattoo. And then after a couple of months, I'm like, hey, that's kind of pretty cool. So the title of the book comes from my dad's last words and just kind of a final lesson in many ways. That is a pretty cool story. Yeah, my wife started getting some tattoos a few years back, and uh, I don't have one uh, myself quite yet. But it sounds like you had a pretty good reason for getting that one. Let's talk maybe a little bit about suffering, because obviously you, you, you must have witnessed your dad suffering. You go to hospice, you see people suffering as a deacon. You know, what are some things, because suffering can challenge our faith. I know uh, it could challenge a lot of people's faith. Um, Maybe just address kind of that topic, just suffering in general. Of all the questions I think I do get asked as a deacon, in many ways, the deacon is almost more relatable than the priest, because oftentimes they are married. They do have kids. They do have family struggles. Husband and wives do argue. No matter what we present from a, the perfect family perspective, none of us is that perfect family, right? So all of our families, we struggle. And there's, in the, we're all dysfunctional in many ways. We're, we're all kind of working the journey here. And of all the questions I think I get asked at the back of church, it is about this suffering. It is about, hey, my husband drinks too much and I don't know what to do. It's the person that says, hey, um, we've got a son on drugs, and and where do we go? My mother has had dementia for five years, and it's so time-intensive, and I sound selfish when I want to say, I hope she dies now because her suffering has been too much in many ways, and and the family is suffering because we're trying to balance the time. And, And how does God let hurricanes that destroy towns and tornadoes and cancer and how does God let all this happen and I've struggled with that question so much myself and that how did God let this one-of-a-kind guy who was such a good person who lived his life in the Beatitudes who was so generous who was involved in so many nonprofits, who not only wrote the check but volunteered and, and clothed the naked and fed the hungry how does god let this happen to that special guy what i came to the conclusion is that we've all got free will the world is revolving and it continues to revolve the day that my father died i realized that the world didn't stop for my dad and that the city of boston didn't stop for my dad that i can remember leaving the hospital for the first time in four days and the meter was still going on the car and there were still people crossing the street at the red light and jaywalking, and the world just keeps moving. But that God is with us. God is with us in that struggle, and that sometimes when we think that God's not part of it, it's when we need him most that he's the most near, and that God's not sitting behind the desk with his arms up saying, you know, I'm a little bored. Let's have a little worldwide pandemic. Let's cause a little childhood cancer and keep everybody on their toes. That none of that is God's doing, but that where God does his best work is when we are in that struggle and we do reach out and we don't know where to turn, that that is where he's closest, that he's in the rubble of our lives in many ways. And that's where we can most find him. And I think that when I was open to that thinking, that's where I most found him is in the most difficult parts of the journey. In my first book for teens, Shadow in the Dark, my main character has all sorts of suffering, and and he winds up getting mentored by a nun, uh, Sister Regina, and he has a similar conversation to the one you were just describing. And instead of her really giving him an answer, she has to wear a crucifix around her neck on her habit. So she just points to the suffering Christ on the cross, and that's her answer to all these questions about suffering. It's kind of just something that I've thought about over the years. Christ on the cross, isn't that our answer to, you know, suffering and, you know, how could God let suffering happen? I mean, here he is on the cross suffering. I don't know if that in any way resonates with your deaconness. It does resonate. And my father was diaconal in so many ways. And in my father, in his journal, and I've got a chapter on this in the suffering chapter of the book, there's a lot of discussion about this. 
of all the notes that my dad wrote in those 25 pages, some of them were rudimentary, like where's the nurse? One of them was commenting on the on the Red Sox game that we were watching on the television monitor, right? So there was some of those just normal conversations that just happened to be in handwriting. But one of the notes that bothered me the most was the note that said, I must suffer. And then a page later, I must suffer more. It was interesting in that when I have conversations with families or people in hospice or people struggling, the question is, is more, why am I suffering? Why is he suffering? It's never an affirmation. And my dad, to just pick up on your exact point, was so aligned to the cross that we all suffer. And maybe it's in the beginning of life. Maybe it's in the middle of life. Maybe it's at the end of life. Maybe it's sprinkled straight line, speaking like a CPA along the way. But we all suffer someplace. And I think my dad realize that suffering is part of the journey, that to truly align yourself with Christ is to suffer. And my, my father understood that. And I, I had spent so much time praying about the notion of I must suffer more. And I think I have concluded that he was on a very difficult journey and that to get to heaven, at some point, you're going to suffer. And how do you get to heaven quicker? You've got to suffer more. So my dad, I think, knew that he had a, a a good life. One of his final other writings was, we've had a good run, right? We've had a good run. That also resonates with me. But I think that he was ready. And I think that in order to get ready, he had to suffer. And he had to suffer more to get there more quickly. So I think my dad was, this has taken a lot of, I could not have had this conversation with you four years ago, right? This has taken a lot of prayer and reflection and quietness and listening. But I think my dad was extremely aligned to the cross in in his affirmation. That's beautiful. What about some of the other lessons that you cover in the book that you learned from your dad? Are there other ones on this theme? I think the notion of resilience. You know, my dad had a tough childhood. His parents died young. His dad died in his 30s of a heart attack. His mom died of heart failure. He was one of four brothers who ended up going individually to four different aunts until one aunt at some point said, uh, that's not right. I'm going to take them all in. And took four young boys under 10 into her own house, where she already had a couple of boys under eight. So she, her and her husband you know, brought up six kids. So I think my dad was a resilient kid. And I think that when you're young and impressionable, you know, you talk about which side of the tracks you might lean on and some kids are going to lean to the wrong side of the tracks. And my dad was very fortunate that he leaned to the right side of the tracks. So I think resiliency is a big, big part of the book. I think practicality, a big part of the book. You know, what's interesting is for listeners who have read the book Tuesdays with Maury, you know, the book has that feel to it in, in, in some ways. And there's no necessarily aha moments in that book as much as it's, it's kind of just a affirmation of what we all already kind of know in some ways aligned to somebody's individual life. And the notion of, of just being practical. My dad was a very practical guy. I think one of the other chapters in the book that I just love is uh, savoring life's little moments, you know, that we're all looking for the big vacation in, in the big event, and my dad just savored the easier parts of life that uh, he could enjoy hot dogs and beans one bite at a time and enjoy that as much as any banquet with 20 side dishes. He was just a very simple guy. As I look back, I knew it at the time, but probably didn't have the full appreciation. We've had two tickets for the Red Sox for 35 years. And I think about all the conversations that he and I had under the stars, watching the Sox, especially watching the Sox beat the Yankees. But that's not important right now. But just Fenway Park, just an old fashioned park and just a hot dog and a beer or when I was younger, a hot dog and a Coke. But just all those conversations and just savored every bit of that. He taught my kids how to play cribbage. He taught my kids how to play chess. He taught my kids how to play golf. And it was less about playing cribbage 
as much as, as we know as dads ourselves, just that disarming quality that if you're out playing hoops with your kids in the driveway, you know, that conversation that happens because you're focused on the ball, at the same time you're focused on the conversation, and that my dad just had so many great conversations with my kids over those very simple games. And, you know, he was one of those grandfathers that, as opposed to, say, talking to the grandchildren periodically, how school, the more generic question, he was the guy that was texting them to say, how did that Latin test go today? Because I know that you were struggling with studying for it, that he was just very engaged in just the notion of savoring life's little moments. You know, one of the things that my wife and I learned from my parents is my parents would sometimes go into Boston and literally sit in the lobby of a hotel with a cup of coffee or it was the afternoon, have a drink with their books and just people watch all the people coming in and out of the lobby while they were reading their book and turned what was probably two hours into what seemed like six because you're able to just stretch it out. My wife and I will do that. We'll go into Boston for breakfast or a day trip, have our books in our back pocket and sit in the lobby of a hotel and just enjoy time by a fireplace or something. And just that savoring notion, that's one of my favorite words is savoring because life is so fast, whether we're in law school or teaching law or in business or how we get from point A to point B that I've learned to really slow down. That I used to be one of those guys that, again, being a Boston guy, the public garden, one of our famous landmarks, and I would get from my point A to point B walking on the outside to get to the next meeting. But now I always allow enough time that I can walk through the public garden and you see the kids on the swan boats, you see the elderly couple sharing the tuna fish sandwich, and you just have an opportunity to slow it down. So savoring has become one of my new favorite words because it's just a great lesson in that moment of just trying to slow it down. You get a lot of these questions about suffering and about faith, I'm assuming, as a deacon, and you yourself had the experience of seeing this in your own family. What do you tell somebody who, you know, there seems like their faith is struggling and it's because somebody in their family is ill uh, or some terrible thing has happened tragically in their family that they didn't expect, and now their their faith is uh, struggling? I tell people that God has a relationship. Christ has a relationship with every single one of us. And it's a different relationship for all of us. And one of the greatest things that we can do is to be open-minded, open-hearted, and to listen. Listening is one of the things that we struggle with the most. Like, I'm going out to dinner with some friends tonight, and I'm sure everyone has their stories. And we're also quick to want to tell our story More often than not, we're not listening to somebody else's story. One of the things I learned in my own grief is that grief has got no rules. Don't let anybody tell you that there's rules that, oh, I thought you would have been over it by now. Or, or, oh, well, well, he or she's in a better place, right? No one, these are all things that we can find hurtful at times. So I think that everybody's journey in suffering, in terminal illness, in difficulties in families, whatever is going on in our own life, it's our story and how we feel. We own those feelings and we should be comfortable with those feelings, even if they're good or bad, and that Jesus is always going to meet us where we are. And it's wonderful to get input from family and friends, but no one knows what we're going through. And just like we can be empathetic and compassionate and caring for other people and And I've got many close friends, but until you've had a child die, you don't know what that mother and father is going through. No matter how much I say, I know, I know, I know, I don't know. So I think that if you're the one suffering, I think being comfortable with your suffering and always getting advice from people and in spiritual direction and believing in something more in in that joy, I think there's just no rules for any of this. And as much good input the best hearted of us can give somebody else, I think listen to what God is telling you and to try to find those quiet moments where we can just listen because everybody's telling us so much. 
the situation is we feel like we're drowning in the situation, I think the ability to slow it down and just listen despite all the noise, God's always speaking to us and we drown him out and the ability to just try to listen and say, what are you trying to tell me? Where do you want me to take this? How do I use this in some way for something better? Where am I going on the other side of this? How do I find that joy? And joy is different than being happy, right? So happiness comes from being on vacation, two scoops of ice cream, reading a good book. Joy is is something different. Joy is when we can still find this place in life that's a good place despite suffering. So the notion of being joyful and hopeful, but I think a lot of it for me came back to just being open and being quiet and being still in the noise of all of it happening around me. I found a lot of good in that quiet. Well, it sounds like your book is, is I'm sure, a beautiful reflection on a lot of the themes you've been talking about, All is Well, Life Lessons from a Preacher's Father. If our listeners want to get a copy of your book or learn more about you and any other things you might be working on, uh, wh- where would you like them to go? Certainly if they Google All is Well, even just All is Well, Kevin Martin, they'll find it on Amazon. They can also find it on the Skyhorse Publishing website. They can find it on the Simon & Schuster distribution site. But certainly if you just Google my name, Kevin Martin, All is Well, you'll find me. And I really hope, I really hope that like any book that's got a lot of different things going on in it, it's really about trying to live your best life ever and trying to live your best life ever despite all the noise happening in our lives. So there's there's stories in the book on miracles and baseball and family. And again, just a lot of great chapters about different themes, but all coming back to living your best life. And again, we've all got very complicated lives. And it it all kind of brings it back to finding joy and hope in all of it. Beautiful. I definitely have appreciated hearing your story and, you know, stories about your dad. And many of the things you said resonated with me. And I appreciate you being on the show today uh, with us. And I appreciate being here and, and, and trying to offer that little slice of faith. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for the show. Again, we've been speaking with Kevin Martin, the Catholic deacon, about his book, All is Well, Life's Lessons from a Preacher's Father. And again, this is Anthony Barone Colank. If you would like to have me come talk to your uh, school or homeschool group about any of my books or writing or the Middle Ages, definitely check out my website at antonycolank.com. But until next time, may God bless us as we rely on our faith to work through the messy challenges of our lives. Mm-hmm.